Chapter Two, Part One of the Rainbow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rainbow by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter Two. They live at the marsh. Part One. She was the daughter of a Polish landowner who, deeply in debt to the Jews, had married a German wife with money, and who had died just before the rebellion. Quite young, she had married Paul Lenski, an intellectual who had studied at Berlin and had returned to Warsaw a patriot. Her mother had married a German merchant and gone away. Lydia Lenski, married to the young doctor, became with him a patriot and an emancipee. They were poor, but they were very conceited. She learned nursing as a mark of her emancipation. They represented in Poland the new movement just begun in Russia, but they were very patriotic and at the same time very European. They had two children. Then came the Great Rebellion. Lenski, very ardent and full of words, went about inciting his countrymen. Little Poles flamed down the streets of Warsaw on the way to shoot every Muscovite. So they crossed into the south of Russia, and it was common for six little insurgents to ride into a Jewish village, brandishing swords and words, emphasizing the fact that they were going to shoot every living Muscovite. Lenski was something of a fire-eater also. Lydia, tempered by her German blood, coming of a different family, was obliterated, carried along in her husband's emphasis of declaration and his whirl of patriotism. He was indeed a brave man, but no bravery could quite have equaled the vividness of his talk. He worked very hard till nothing lived in him but his eyes, and Lydia, as if drugged, followed him like a shadow, serving, echoing. Sometimes she had her two children, sometimes they were left behind. She returned once to find them both dead of diphtheria. Her husband wept aloud, unaware of everybody. But the war went on, and soon he was back at his work. A darkness had come over Lydia's mind. She walked always in a shadow, silenced, with a strange deep terror having hold of her. Her desire was to seek satisfaction in dread, to enter a nunnery, to satisfy the instincts of dread in her through service of a dark religion, but she could not. Then came the flight to London. Lenski, the little thin man, had got all his life locked into a resistance and could not relax again. He lived in a sort of insane irritability, touchy, haughty to the last degree, fractious, so that, as assistant doctor in one of the hospitals, he soon became impossible. They were almost beggars, but he kept still his great ideas of himself. He seemed to live in a complete hallucination, where he himself figured vivid and lordly. He guarded his wife jealously against the ignominy of her position, rushed round her like a brandished weapon, an amazing sight to the English eye, had her in his power as if he hypnotized her. She was passive, dark, always in shadow. He was wasting away. Already, when the child was born, he seemed nothing but skin and bone and fixed idea. She watched him dying, nursed him, nursed the baby, but really took no notice of anything. A darkness was on her, like remorse, or like a remembering of the dark, savage, mystic ride of dread, of death, of the shadow of revenge. When her husband died, she was relieved. He would no longer dart about her. England fitted her mood, its aloofness and foreignness. She had known a little of the language before coming, and a sort of parrot mind made her pick it up fairly easily. But she knew nothing of the English, nor of English life. Indeed, these did not exist for her. She was like one walking in the underworld, where the shades throng intelligibly, but have no connection with one. She felt the English people as a potent, cold, slightly hostile host amongst whom she walked isolated. The English people themselves were almost deferential to her. The church saw that she did not want. She walked without passion, like a shade, tormented into moments of love by the child. 
her dying husband, with his tortured eyes and the skin drawn tight over his face, he was as a vision to her, not a reality. In a vision he was buried and put away. Then the vision ceased. She was untroubled. Time went on gray, uncolored, like a long journey where she sat unconscious as the landscape unrolled beside her. When she rocked her baby at evening, maybe she fell into a Polish slumber song, or she talked sometimes to herself in Polish. Otherwise she did not think of Poland, nor of that life to which she had belonged. It was a great blot, looming blank in its darkness. In the superficial activity of her life she was all English. She even thought in English. But her long blanks and darknesses of abstraction were Polish. So she lived for some time. Then, with slight uneasiness, she used half to awake to the streets of London. She realized that there was something around her, very foreign. She realized she was in a strange place, and then she was sent away into the country. There came into her mind now the memory of her home where she had been a child, the big house among the land, the peasants of the village. She was sent to Yorkshire to nurse an old rector in his rectory by the sea. This was the first shake of the kaleidoscope that brought in front of her eyes something she must see. It hurt her brain, the open country and the moors. It hurt her and hurt her, yet it forced itself upon her as something living. It roused some potency of her childhood in her. It had some relation to her. There was green and silver and blue in the air about her now, and there was a strange insistence of light from the sea to which she must attend. Primroses glimmered around, many of them, and she stooped to the disturbing influence near her feet. She even picked one or two flowers, faintly remembering in the new color of life what had been. All the day long as she sat at the upper window, the light came off the sea, constantly constantly without refusal till it seemed to bear her away and the noise of the sea created a drowsiness in her a relaxation like sleep her automatic consciousness gave way a little she stumbled sometimes she had a poignant momentary vision of her living child that hurt her unspeakably her soul roused to attention very strange was the constant glitter of the sea unsheathed in heaven very warm and sweet the graveyard, in a nook of the hill, catching the sunshine and holding it as one holds a bee between the palms of the hands when it is benumbed. Gray grass and lichens and a little church and snowdrops among coarse grass and a cup full of incredibly warm sunshine. She was troubled in spirit. Hearing the rushing of the beck away down under the trees, she was startled and wondered what it was. Walking down, she found the bluebells around her glowing like a presence among the trees. Summer came. The moors were tangled with harebells like water in the ruts of the roads. The heather came rosy under the skies, setting the whole world awake. And she was uneasy. She went past the gorse bushes, shrinking from their presence. She stepped into the heather as into a quickening bath that almost hurt. Her fingers moved over the clasped fingers of the child. She heard the anxious voice of the baby as it tried to make her talk, distraught. And she shrank away again back into her darkness, and for a long while remained blotted safely away from living. But autumn came with the faint red glimmer of robins singing, winter darkened the moors, and almost savagely she turned again to life, demanding her life back again demanding that it should be as it had been when she was a girl, on the land at home, under the sky. Snow lay in great expanses. The telegraph posts strode over the wide earth, away under the gloom of the sky, and savagely her desire rose in her again, demanding that this was Poland, her youth, that all was her own again. But there were no sledges nor bells. She did not see the peasants coming out like new people in their sheepskins and their fresh, ruddy, bright faces that seemed to become new and vivid when the snow lit up the ground. It did not come to her, the life of her youth. It did not come back. There was a little agony of struggle, then a relapse into the darkness of the convent, 
where Satan and the devils raged round the walls, and Christ was white on the cross of victory. She watched from the sick room the snow whirl past like flocks of shadows in haste, flying on some final mission out to a leaden, inalterable sea, beyond the final whiteness of the curving shore and the snow-speckled blackness of the rocks half submerged. But near at hand on the trees the snow was soft in bloom. Only the voice of the dying vicar spoke gray and querulous from behind. By the time the snowdrops were out, however, he was dead. He was dead. But with curious equanimity the returning woman watched the snowdrops on the edge of the grass below, blown white in the wind, but not to be blown away. She watched them fluttering and bobbing, the white shut flowers anchored by a thread to the grey-green grass, yet never blown away, not drifting with the wind. As she rose in the morning, the dawn was beating up white, gusts of light blown like a thin snowstorm from the east, blown stronger and fiercer till the rose appeared and the gold, and the sea lit up below. She was impassive and indifferent, yet she was outside the enclosure of darkness. There passed a space of shadow again, the familiarity of dread worship, during which she was moved, oblivious to Cassite. There at first there was nothing, just grey nothing. But then one morning there was a light from the yellow jasmine caught her, and after that morning and evening the persistent ringing of thrushes from the shrubbery, till her heart, beaten upon, was forced to lift up its voice in rivalry and answer. Little tunes came into her mind. She was full of trouble, almost like anguish. Resistant, she knew she was beaten and from fear of darkness turned to fear of light. She would have hidden herself indoors if she could. Above all, she craved for the peace and heavy oblivion of her old state. She could not bear to come to, to realize. The first pangs of this new parturition were so acute, she knew she could not bear it. She would rather remain out of life than be torn, mutilated into this birth which she could not survive. She had not the strength to come to life now, in England, so foreign, skies so hostile. She knew she would die like an early colourless, scentless flower that the end of the winter puts forth mercilessly, and she wanted to harbour her modicum of twinkling life. But a sunshiny day came, full of the scent of a mezzeron tree, when bees were tumbling into the yellow crocuses, and she forgot. She felt like somebody else, not herself, a new person, quite glad. But she knew it was fragile, and she dreaded it. The vicar put pea-flower into the crocuses for his bees to roll in, and she laughed. Then night came, with brilliant stars that she knew of old from her girlhood, and they flashed so bright she knew they were victors. She could neither wake nor sleep as if crushed between the past and the future, like a flower that comes above ground to find a great stone lying above it. She was helpless. The bewilderment and helplessness continued. She was surrounded by great moving masses that must crush her, and there was no escape, save in the old obliviousness, the cold darkness she strove to retain. But the vicar showed her eggs in the thrush's nest near the back door. She saw herself the mother thrush upon the nest, and the way her wings were spread, so eager down upon her secret. The tense, eager nesting wings moved her beyond endurance. She thought of them in the morning, when she heard the thrush whistling as he got up, and she thought, Why didn't I die out there? Why am I brought here? She was aware of people who passed around her, not as persons, but as looming presences was very difficult for her to adjust herself. In Poland the peasantry, the people, had been cattle to her. They had been her cattle that she owned and used. What were these people? Now she was coming awake, she was lost. But she had felt Brangwen go by almost as if he had brushed her. She had tingled in body as she had gone on up the road. After she had been with him in the marsh kitchen, the voice of her body had risen strong and insistent. Soon she wanted him. He was the man who had come nearest to her for her awakening. 
Always, however, between whiles, she lapsed into the old unconsciousness, indifference, and there was a will in her to save herself from living any more, but she would wake in the morning one day and feel her blood running, feel herself lying open like a flower unsheathed in the sun, insistent and potent with demand. She got to know him better, and her instinct fixed on him, just on him. Her impulse was strong against him, because he was not of her own sort. But one blind instinct led her to take him, to leave him, and then to relinquish herself to him. It would be safety. She felt the rooted safety of him, and the life in him. Also he was young and very fresh. The blue, steady livingness of his eyes she enjoyed like morning. He was very young. Then she lapsed again to stupor and indifference. This, however, was bound to pass. The warmth flowed through her. She felt herself opening, unfolding, asking, as a flower opens in full request under the sun, as the beaks of tiny birds open flat, to receive, to receive, and unfolded she turned to him, straight to him, and he came, slowly, afraid, held back by uncouth fear and driven by a desire bigger than himself. When she opened and turned to him, then all that had been and all that was was gone from her. She was as new as a flower that unsheathes itself and stands always ready, waiting, receptive. He could not understand this. He forced himself, through lack of understanding, to the adherence to the line of honorable courtship and sanctioned licensed marriage. Therefore, after he had gone to the vicarage and asked for her, she remained for some days held in this one spell, open, receptive to him, before him. He was roused to chaos. He spoke to the vicar and gave in the bands. Then he stood to wait. She remained attentive and instinctively expectant before him, unfolded, ready to receive him. He could not act because of self-fear and because of his conception of honor towards her, so he remained in a state of chaos. And after a few days, gradually, she closed again, away from him, was sheathed over, impervious to him, oblivious. Then a black, bottomless despair became real to him. He knew what he had lost. He felt he had lost it for good. He knew what it was to have been in communication with her, and to be cast off again. In misery, his heart like a heavy stone, he went about unliving. Till gradually he became desperate, lost his understanding, was plunged in a revolt that knew no bounds. Inarticulate, he moved with her at the marsh, in violent, gloomy, wordless passion, almost in hatred of her, till gradually she became aware of him, Aware of herself with regard to him, her blood stirred to life, she began to open towards him, to flow towards him again. He waited till the spell was between them again, till they were together within one rushing, hastening flame, and then again he was bewildered. He was tied up as with cords, and could not move to her, so she came to him, and unfastened the breast of his waistcoat and his shirt, and put her hand on him, needing to know him for it was cruel to her to be opened and offered to him, yet not to know what he was, not even that he was there. She gave herself to the hour, but he could not, and he bungled in taking her. So that he lived in suspense, as if only half his faculties worked until the wedding. She did not understand, but the vagueness came over her again, and the days lapsed by. He could not get definitely into touch with her. For the time being, she let him go again. He suffered very much from the thought of actual marriage, the intimacy and nakedness of marriage. He knew her so little, they were so foreign to each other, they were such strangers, and they could not talk to each other. When she talked of Poland or of what had been, it was all so foreign, she scarcely communicated anything to him, and when he looked at her, in overmuch reverence and fear of the unknown, changed the nature of his desire into a sort of worship, holding her aloof from his physical desire, self-thwarting. She did not know this. She did not understand. They had looked at each other and had accepted each other. It was so. 
then there was nothing to balk at it was complete between them at the wedding his face was stiff and expressionless he wanted to drink to get rid of his forethought and afterthought to set the moment free but he could not the suspense only tightened at his heart the jesting and joviality and jolly broad insinuation of the guests only coiled him more he could not hear that which was impending obsessed him he could not get free she sat quiet with a strange still smile she was not afraid having accepted him she wanted to take him she belonged altogether to the hour now no future no past only this her hour she did not even notice him as she sat beside him at the head of the table he was very near their coming together was close at hand what more as the time came for all the guests to go her dark face was softly lighted the bend of her head was proud her gray eyes clear and dilated so that the men could not look at her and the women were elated by her they served her very wonderful she was as she bade farewell her ugly wide mouth smiling with pride and recognition her voice speaking softly and richly in the foreign accent her dilated eyes ignoring one and all the departing guests her manner was gracious and fascinating but she ignored the being of him or her to whom she gave her hand and brangwen stood beside her giving his hearty handshake to his friends receiving their regard gratefully glad of their attention his heart was tormented within him he did not try to smile the time of his trial and his admittance his gethsemane and his triumphal entry in one had come now behind her there was so much unknown to him when he approached her he came to such a terrible painful unknown how could he embrace it and fathom it how could he close his arms round all this darkness and hold it to his breast and give himself to it what might not happen to him if he stretched and strained for ever he would never be able to grasp it all and to yield himself naked out of his own hands into the unknown power how could a man be strong enough to take her put his arms round her and have her and be sure he could conquer this awful unknown next to his heart what was it then that she was to which he must also deliver himself up and which at the same time he must embrace contain he was to be her husband it was established so and he wanted it more than he wanted life or anything she stood beside him in her silk dress looking at him strangely so that a certain terror horror took possession of him because she was strange and impending and he had no choice he could not bear to meet her look from under her strange thick brows is it late she said he looked at his watch no half past eleven he said and he made an excuse to go into the kitchen leaving her standing in the room among the disorder and the drinking glasses tilly was seated beside the fire in the kitchen her head in her hands she started up when he entered why haven't you gone to bed he said i thought i'd better stop and lock up and do she said her agitation quietened him he gave her some little order, then returned, steadied now, almost ashamed, to his wife. She stood a moment watching him as he moved with averted face. Then she said, You will be good to me, won't you? She was small and girlish and terrible, with a queer, wide look in her eyes. His heart leaped in him. In anguish of love and desire, he went blindly to her and took her in his arms. I want to, he said as he drew her closer and closer in she was soothed by the stress of his embrace and remained quite still relaxed against him mingling in to him and he let himself go from past and future was reduced to the moment with her in which he took her and was with her and there was nothing beyond they were together in an elemental embrace beyond their superficial foreignness but in the morning he was uneasy again she was still foreign and unknown to him only within the fear was pride belief in himself as mate for her and she everything forgotten in her new hour of coming to life radiated vigor and joy so that he quivered to touch her it made a great difference to him marriage 
things became so remote and of so little significance as he knew the powerful source of his life his eyes opened on a new universe and he wondered in thinking of his triviality before a new calm relationship showed to him in the things he saw in the cattle he used the young wheat as it eddied in a wind and each time he returned home he went steadily expectantly like a man who goes to a profound unknown satisfaction at dinner-time he appeared in the doorway hanging back a moment from entering to see if she was there he saw her setting the plates on the white scrubbed table her arms were slim she had a slim body and full skirts she had a dark shapely head with close banded hair somehow it was her head so shapely and poignant that revealed her his woman to him as she moved about clothed closely full skirted and wearing her little silk apron her dark hair smoothly parted her head revealed itself to him in all its subtle intrinsic beauty and he knew she was his woman he knew her essence that it was his to possess and he seemed to live thus in contact with her in contact with the unknown the unaccountable and incalculable they did not take much notice of each other consciously i'm betimes he said yes she answered he turned to the dogs or to the child if she was there the little Anna played about the farm, flitting constantly in to call something to her mother, to fling her arms round her mother's skirts, to be noticed, perhaps caressed, then forgetting to slip out again. Then Brangwen, talking to the child, or to the dog between his knees, would be aware of his wife, as in her tight dark bodice and her lace fichu she was reaching up to the corner cupboard. He realized with a sharp pang that she belonged to him and he to her, he realized that he lived by her. Did he own her? Was she here forever, or might she go away? She was not really his. It was not a real marriage, this marriage between them. She might go away. He did not feel like a master, husband, father of her children. She belonged elsewhere. Any moment she might be gone, and he was ever drawn to her, drawn after her, with ever-raging, ever-unsatisfied desire. He must always turn home, wherever his steps were taking him, always to her, and he could never quite reach her, he could never quite be satisfied, never be at peace, because she might go away. At evening he was glad. Then when he had finished in the yard and come in and washed himself, when the child was put to bed, he could sit on the other side of the fire with his beer on the hob and his long white pipe in his fingers, conscious of her there opposite him as she worked at her embroidery or as she talked to him and he was safe with her now till morning she was curiously self-sufficient and did not say very much occasionally she lifted her head her gray eyes shining with a strange light that had nothing to do with him or with this place and would tell him about herself she seemed to be back again in the past chiefly in her childhood or her girlhood, with her father. She very rarely talked of her first husband, but sometimes, all shining-eyed, she was back at her own home, telling him about the riotous times, the trip to Paris with her father, tales of the mad acts of the peasants when a burst of religious, self-hurting fervor had passed over the country. She would lift her head and say, when they brought the railway across the country, they made afterwards smaller railways, of shorter width, to come down to our town a hundred miles. When I was a girl, Gisla, my German gouvernante, was very shocked, and she would not tell me. But I heard the servants talking. I remember. It was Pierre, the coachman, and my father and some of his friends, landowners. They had taken a wagon, a whole railway wagon, that you travel in. A railway carriage, said Brangwen. She laughed to herself. I know it was a great scandal. Yes, a whole wagon. And they had girls, you know, fields, naked, all the wagon full. And so they came down to our village. They came through villages of the Jews, and it was a great scandal. Can you imagine all the countryside? And my mother, she did not like it. Gisla said to me, Madame, she must not know that you have heard such things. 
My mother, she used to cry, and she wished to beat my father, plainly beat him. He would say, when she cried, because he sold the forest, the wood, to jingle money in his pocket and go to Warsaw or Paris or Kiev, when she said he must take back his word, he must not sell the forest, he would stand and say, I know, I know, I have heard it all, I have heard it all before. Tell me some new thing. I know, I know, I know. Oh, but can you understand? I loved him when he stood there under the door, saying only, I know, I know, I know it all already. She could not change him, no, not if she killed herself for it, and she could change everybody else, but him, she could not change him. Brangwen could not understand. He had pictures of a cattle truck full of naked girls riding from nowhere to nowhere, of Lydia laughing because her father made great debts and said, I know, I know, of Jews running down the streets shouting in Yiddish, Don't do it, don't do it, and being cut down by demented peasants. She called them cattle, while she looked on interested and even amused of tutors and governesses and parents and a convent. It was too much for him. And there she sat, telling the tales to the open space, not to him, arrogating a curious superiority to him, a distance between them, something strange and foreign and outside his life, talking, rattling without rhyme or reason, laughing when he was shocked or astounded, condemning nothing, confounding his mind and making the whole world a chaos, without order or stability of any kind. Then, when they went to bed, he knew that he had nothing to do with her. She was back in her childhood. He was a peasant, a serf, a servant, a lover, a paramour, a shadow, a nothing. He lay still in amazement, staring at the room he knew so well, and wondering whether it was really there. The window, the chest of drawers— or whether it was merely a figment in the atmosphere. And gradually he grew into a raging fury against her. But because he was so much amazed, and there was as yet such a distance between them, and she was such an amazing thing to him, with all wonder opening out behind her, he made no retaliation on her. Only he lay still and wide-eyed with rage, inarticulate, not understanding, but solid with hostility. And he remained wrathful and distinct from her, unchanged outwardly to her, but underneath a solid power of antagonism to her, of which she became gradually aware, and it irritated her to be made aware of him as a separate power. She lapsed into a sort of sombre exclusion, a curious communion with mysterious powers, a sort of mystic dark state which drove him and the child nearly mad, he walked about for days, stiffened with resistance to her, stiff with a will to destroy her as she was. Then suddenly out of nowhere there was connection between them again. It came on him as he was working in the fields. The tension, the bond, burst, and the passionate flood broke forward into a tremendous, magnificent rush, so that he felt he could snap off the trees as he passed and create the world afresh. And when he arrived home there was no sign between them. He waited and waited till she came, and as he waited his limbs seemed strong and splendid to him. His hands seemed like passionate servants to him. Goodly, he felt a stupendous power in himself of life and of urgent strong blood. She was sure to come at last and touch him. Then he burst into flame for her and lost himself. They looked at each other, a deep laugh at the bottom of their eyes, and he went to take of her again, wholesale, mad to revel in the inexhaustible wealth of her, to bury himself in the depths of her, in an inexhaustible exploration, she all the while reveling in that he reveled in her, tossed all her secrets aside and plunged to that which was secret to her as well, whilst she quivered with fear in the last anguish of delight. What did it matter who they were, whether they knew each other or not. The hour passed away again. There was severance between them, and rage and misery and bereavement for her, and deposition and toiling at the mill with slaves for him. But no matter. They had had their hour, and should it chime again, they were ready for it, ready to renew the game at the point where it was left off, 
on the edge of the outer darkness, when the secrets within the woman are game for the man, hunted doggedly, when the secrets of the woman are the man's adventure, and they both give themselves to the adventure. She was with child, and there was again the silence and distance between them. She did not want him, nor his secrets, nor his game. He was deposed. He was cast out. He seethed with fury at the small, ugly-mouthed woman who had nothing to do with him. Sometimes his anger broke on her, but she did not cry. She turned on him like a tiger, and there was battle. He had to learn to contain himself again, and he hated it. He hated her that she was not there for him, and he took himself off anywhere. But an instinct of gratitude and a knowledge that she would receive him back again, that later on she would be there for him again, prevented his straying very far. He cautiously did not go too far. He knew she might lapse into ignorance of him, lapse away from him, farther, 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 till she was lost to him. He had sense enough, premonition enough in himself to be aware of this, and to measure himself accordingly, for he did not want to lose her. He did not want her to lapse away. Cold, he called her, selfish, only caring about herself, a foreigner with a bad nature, caring really about nothing, having no proper feelings at the bottom of her, and no proper niceness. He raged and piled up accusations that had some measure of truth in them all, but a certain grace in him forbade him from going too far. He knew, and he quivered with rage and hatred, that she was all these vile things, that she was everything vile and detestable. But he had grace at the bottom of him which told him that, above all things, he did not want to lose her. He was not going to lose her. So he kept some consideration for her. He preserved some relationship. He went out more often to the Red Lion again, to escape the madness of sitting next to her when she did not belong to him, when she was as absent as any woman in indifference could be. He could not stay at home, so he went to the Red Lion, and sometimes he got drunk, but he preserved his measure. Some things between them he never forfeited. A tormented look came into his eyes, as if something were always dogging him. He glanced sharp and quick. He could not bear to sit still doing nothing. He had to go out to find company, to give himself away there, for he had no other outlet. He could not work to give himself out. He had not the knowledge. As the months of her pregnancy went on, she left him more and more alone. She was more and more unaware of him. His existence was annulled, and he felt bound down, bound, unable to stir, beginning to go mad, ready to rave for she was quiet and polite, as if he did not exist, as one is quiet and polite to a servant. Nevertheless, she was great with his child. It was his turn to submit. She sat opposite him, sewing, her foreign face inscrutable and indifferent. He felt he wanted to break her into acknowledgment of him, into awareness of him. It was insufferable that she had so obliterated him. He would smash her into regarding him. He had a raging agony of desire to do so. But something bigger in him withheld him, kept him motionless. So he went out of the house for relief, or he turned to the little girl for her sympathy and her love. He appealed with all his power to the small Anna. So soon they were like lovers, father and child. For he was afraid of his wife. As she sat there with bent head, silent, working or reading, but so unutterably silent that his heart seemed under the millstone of it, she became herself like the upper millstone lying on him, crushing him as sometimes a heavy sky lies on the earth. Yet he knew he could not tear her away from the heavy obscurity into which she was merged. He must not try to tear her into recognition of himself and agreement with himself. It were disastrous, impious, so let him rage as he might, he must withhold himself. But his wrists trembled and seemed mad, seemed as if they would burst. When, in November, the leaves came beating against the window shutters with a lashing sound, he started and his eyes flickered with flame. The dog looked up at him. He sunk his head to the fire, but his wife was startled. He was aware of her listening. 
"'They blow up with a rattle,' he said. "'What?' she asked. "'The leaves.' She sank away again. The strange leaves beating in the wind on the wood had come nearer than she. The tension in the room was overpowering. It was difficult for him to move his head. He sat with every nerve, every vein, every fibre of muscle in his body stretched on a tension. He felt like a broken arch thrust sickeningly out from support. For her response was gone. He thrust at nothing, and he remained himself. He saved himself from crashing down into nothingness, from being squandered into fragments, by sheer tension, sheer backward resistance. End of chapter 2, part 1